Welcome to Chapter 9, Connecting to and Setting up a Network. So in this chapter, we're looking at TCP, looking at basic how to set up a network, how to configure as well as securely configure uh, a network and a router. And so keep in mind, this is not a Network Plus exam. This isn't a networking course. So our networking concepts are going to be kind of simplified heavily. So to understand TCP IP networking, we can break it down into client server or a few other types of methodologies. Client server is one of the big ones. Everything is broken down into three levels of communication, hardware, operating systems, and application. And for example, like you have a user using an application who will then send information through the operating system and the hardware to get a response through a network resource. For example, when you go to google.com, you type google.com in a web browser, it goes through your operating system, through the hardware, through the internet to a server who then responds with the appropriate Google page. So with that, we have to break down the different levels of communication, hardware, operating system, and application into something that we can more relate to. So to do that, we're gonna look at the different layers and what makes up those layers, as well as how communication truly happens. So communication happens through um, protocols. Protocols are basically the language. And the main protocol, the main language that the internet uses is called the TCP IP, or Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. So we're gonna talk about Transmission Control Protocol, TCP, here shortly. But in essence, it's the primary language the internet uses. Part of that language is also things like formatting, how we break up data so that we can manage it. Data is normally broken up into segments, such little chunks, uh, and we're going to package them in such a way where we can put them on the internet. So if we want to send a message, normally we don't send a single message. We take that single message and we break it up into chunks or into packets. And we'll have to do some addressing information with each chunk that way we can make sure that it gets to the destination. So layer one is the hardware layer. This is gonna deal with the physical. It's gonna deal with things like the connections. Uh, this might also include things like the MAC address. Here we see the hardware layer, the MAC address, the OS layer, which is the TCP IP or the address ranges, logical address. And we have to deal with the application, which is HTTP, or the port addresses. Again, this is simplified networking to keep things basic. So moving on, the second layer, the OS layer, again, dealing with TCP, manages communication between itself and other computers. This is gonna be using both TCP and IP. The IP portion is gonna be using the logical addressing. And that's how we actually send communication between one network and another network is through IP addressing. IP addressing can be one of two types, either a 32-bit or a 64-bit, depending on if it is IP version 4 or IPv version 6. Also, we're going to combine things with the IP address to show what part of the address is part of the network and what part are part of the hosts. Essentially, the network describes the group of computers, while the hosts are gonna be the individual computers and the address that are assigned to them. Layer three is the application layer. It deals with client communication and specific applications, and we can identify those applications based off of a unique port number. For example, if we're dealing with email, it could be port number 25 because port 25 deals specifically with email. If we're dealing with web traffic, that could be specifically port 80 because HTTP, which is web traffic, is flowing over port 80. If we are talking about secured web traffic, HTTPS, we know that's gonna be port 443. So port numbers actually help define what applications we're using. Now, not all applications have a port number assigned. There are 64,000 port numbers, and there's only a handful of well-known ports. 
And again, this is what it would look like conceptually. We're getting a segment, we're getting a packet of data, and it's being delivered. And if we know it is coming in on port 80, then we know that's going to be for web traffic. So how do we get a MAC address? MAC addresses are embedded on the network card by the manufacturer. So how do we get an IP address? An IP address is logical, which means it can change. And there's two big ways. We can get it statically or manually, which is basically you manually put it in, or dynamically, meaning a server or a service hands us an address. And that's known as Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP. So there's a process for that service or server to give you a IP address temporarily. Again, we already said IPs have two versions, IP version 4, 32-bit, and IP version 6, which is 128-bit. Who controls these addresses? The Internet Assigned Number Authority, or IANA. They're the ones keeping track of all public IP addresses globally. So the important part to realize is a IP address for IPv4 is 32 bits long. That 32 bit group is actually broken up into four groups of eight bits. And because there's eight bits per group, we can actually represent each group between the numbers of zero and 255. Because again, if you take that binary number of eight bits and you sort them all off to zero and you manipulate them, you can have any range combination between zero and 255. So a long time ago, we had IP classes, class A, class B, class C. And it was common for us to organize our networks with class A, class B, or class C, regardless of requirements. So the class A network, you had the first group, the first octet, the first number would be between 1 and 126. That'd be class A. Class B would be 128 through 191. And class C would be 192 through 223. That way, if you've seen a number, you could figure out what class they are based off of what first number it is. So with class A, you could have a total of 126 networks each network having 16 million. With class B, you could have 16,000 networks, each of those networks consisting of 65,000 hosts. And lastly, you could have 2 million class C networks, each of those networks being 254. So how we use the classes. Again, this is just how we identify the classes based off the first octet. So again, here we have class A, class B, class C. The first octet versus the first two octets versus the first three octets. Depending on the class, it locks in certain octets. If the octet is locked in, it's part of the network. We don't get to touch it. That's why class A has so many millions of hosts, because we have the second, third, and fourth octet to play with. That's also why class C has so few hosts, is because the first three octets are locked in. We have a few special addresses like 255, 255, 255, 255. That's a broadcast that's sent to everyone. We also have a 127001 address. That's a special address that basically says, just look back at yourself. So that, now let's move into subnetting. Subnetting is a way for us to group large networks into more manageable chunks. For example, maybe we want to group a class A network, for example, 69.0.0.0, because that network gives us 16 million hosts. Well, maybe we want to separate it into different networks. We could do that. We could do it based off of manipulating different octet groups. That will let us know well, what part is the network what part are the hosts? And how we do that is with a subnet mask. With a subnet mask, it lets us know what parts of the IP address is the network and what parts is the hosts. Where the ones are at, that's part of the network ID. Where the zeros are at, that's where 
the host portion is. Again, we don't normally get to manipulate the ones, we get to manipulate the zeros. And this is, these ones and zeros are just for the subnet mask. This is always really confusing, but I've already prepared a good amount of videos on subnetting already. So if subnetting is confusing to you, go back to those other videos on subnetting for you to have a better understanding. So each of these, for example, class A, one, 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 there are eight ones. So if they're all ones, that really is, if you convert it back to decimal, 255.0.0.0. That's how class A works. That's a class A network. Class B gets a 255.255.0.0 subnet mask. So an IP address is one part of it. The subnet mask is another part of it. We also have a default gateway. That's going to be our exit point for our network. And we have additional services like DNS that also have to be there. But we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail here coming up. So again, the dividing of a subnet, dividing of a network into different groups can be done by manipulating that subnet mask. So we talked about private and public IP addresses. IANA controls public IP addresses. Those are the IPs available on the internet. We also have private IP addresses that mask a public IP address. So we can have lots of private IP addresses that are masking it to a public IP address. And that process is called NAT, Network Address Translation. Now this is where it becomes important. The following private networks are something that you should know. If a network is starting with the 10 address, 10.anything is going to be a private IP address. For the class Bs, it's going to be anything that starts with 172.16.0.0, and that's going to be through 172.31.255.255. Those will be class B private networks. And lastly, we have class C private networks. That's going to be anything between 192.168.0.0 and 192.168.255.255. Those will all be private IP addresses. Moving on to IPv6, that uses 128 bits. And here we do groups of 16 bits. So these are all hexadecimal numbers. So each number is really a four bit number. And there's different rules. For example, we can remove leading zeros on a string of numbers. So like those we can get rid of, those we can get rid of, that we can get rid of, and we can get rid of the first three. We have to leave one zero so that we know that this is a number. So what do we do with this one right here? We have two groups of double or all quad zeros. We, we can actually double colon that. That way, that's going to make up the remaining space. That's how come we can get a 2001. We could actually get rid of those three zeros. Zero, B80, double colon, D3 colon 9C5A colon CC. You can always go back and wherever there's uh, not four, four numbers, put zeros there. Only one set of double and colons can be used on an IP address. We've got to keep that in mind. So some key terms you're going to have to know for IPv6 is what a link or a local link is going to be. And that's going to be a local area network or a LAN or WAN bound by a router. That's going to be the link for our local network. An interface, that's where we're going to be attaching our end node or our node or our physical cable. An interface ID normally is four blocks of an IP address. Neighbor are just going to be the other hosts or other computers on the same network. So because we have both IPv4 and IPv6, we had a few different ways to transverse or travel the networks. And that was ISATAP, uh, Torito, 
or 6 to 4. So these are all different variations of how we can get IPv6 packets over an IPv4 network. These aren't super important right now because they're not really tested on, but it's more of a, there is a way for us to do the communication. Next, we have to talk about the different types of addresses. In IPv6, we have a unicast address, and that's a one-to-one -one address. We have a multicast address, which is a one-to-many address. And we have an anycast address, and that's normally used by a router, and that will identify multiple destinations and packets that will be delivered to the closest destination. So similar to multicast, but not quite. Uh, we've got rid of broadcast in IPv6, and we replaced it, them with anycast. So also, we have to understand how the addresses are used. Like a global unicast, that's a global IP address. We have a link local unicast, and that's just more of a local address. And then we have a unique local address. So with a global address, the first three bits are always the same. It's always going to be 001 for global unicast addresses. So that means we can have any address as long as the first three bits are 001. So that means the first bit should start with either a 2000 or 3000. And that will let us know if it's a global unicast address or not. Where link local will always be FE80. Those will always start with FE80. If you see an FE80, you know automatically it's a link local address. Here we have a graphical representation of that. So how do we view IP address settings? We can go to the command prompt and we can type in ipconfig. And with ipconfig, we can actually see the IPv4, the IPv6, all of the detailed information that we're going to need. You'll also notice under uh, IPv6 sections, we're going to have both a public IP address and a link local IP address. Again, you'll notice that by 2000, or well, 2001, and you'll notice the link local because it starts with FE80. So we can identify uh, PCs based off of a few different things, like the computer name or the computer work group name, or if there's a uh, domain name. If we have a PC with a work group or a domain name, we can have a fully qualified domain name, and that is essentially the host name dot the domain name. And because we can start dealing with names, we have to have a service that can translate between names and IP addresses. And that is where DNS comes in. DNS allows us to find the names or the IP addresses of names. That way we can go to like google.com, but in reality, DNS is translating that to the IP address of Google, and that way we can send it there. Here we have the, our different layers, as well as the typical seven layer OSI model. So we have the application, the operating system, and the hardware layer stacked up against the traditional OSI 7-layer model. Here is where we start getting into the different protocols used by an operating system. So the two major protocols used for communication in networking is TCP and UDP. TCP is connection-oriented, meaning it's guaranteed delivery. If you send something, if it doesn't get to the destination, it's resent. And that's opposite of UDP. UDP is best effort. Meaning, if I send it, if you don't get it, oh well. So TCP is classified connection oriented, where UDP is connectionless oriented. We already talked about a few of the applications used by protocols like HTTP and HTTPS and SMTP. These are important because you have to understand the port numbers that they come off of. POP for delivering mail. SMTP used to send mail. So if you want to block the sending of email, you would block SMTP. You also have things like SMB, which is used for file sharing. You also have things like FTP, used for 
file transferring, you have some of the secured files like SSH or secure FTP. Uh, you also have remote connection uh, protocols like remote desktop protocol, which is used for us to remotely connect to a Windows PC. Now let's we're going to slowly get into how to connect a computer on a network for the most quick and easiest steps. So first of all, if we're using a wired connection, we have to have a wireless network card. We're going to connect an Ethernet cable to a router or a switch or some type of connection port so that we can get connected to a switch or router. We will then get an IP address, assuming we're connecting to a router, uh, which will be assigned to us. That's going to be a dynamic IP address. If we're hooked up to a router and the router has internet connectivity, our traffic should pass through the router to the internet. Thus, we should be able to verify our, our internet connectivity. There's troubleshooting methods for our wired connections in the network and sharing center. Here at the very top, you can see our PC as it flows through the internet. And we can view details information by clicking on the change adapter settings on the top left hand side. We can view things like uh, property settings by going to that change adapter settings by looking at the properties and then looking at the IPv4 properties. When you're doing that, you can also look at additional configuration settings. So here we have that same screen. I'm going to go to my adapter settings. I'm going to choose my physical adapter. Uh, here I can see my link speed. I can see how long I've been on, how much packets I've sent and received. I can go to properties. Now I'm going to go ahead and look at IPv4. Go to its properties. Here's where you can do a lot of the uh, settings, either manually by obtaining or manually by using them, or DHCP by clicking obtain. You also have an alternate configuration, so you can have additional information here if you want. You can disable and re-enable from that location. You can do status. That's this screen. If you click on details, you can actually do the same thing by verifying information. The DNS settings that are there, uh, link local addresses. I don't have a public IPv6 address. I only have link local, but that's OK. So wireless, same general steps, except we have to do a wireless. And then you have to connect to the appropriate wireless device. Uh, normally, we have to double check that it's secured. Uh, we can secure it with a security key. We can also secure it by doing things like not broadcasting the uh, name of the network. We could also do things like uh, requiring MAC addresses that are specific. So you may only allow five MAC addresses, but you manually put those MAC addresses in. Uh, if we're connecting via a cellular network, you'd be doing it through a SIM. Here's the back of a phone, an AT&T phone, where you can do it. Through that SIM card, you can gain access to your cellular data network. And you can also then tether your wireless device and a laptop so that your laptop can use your cellular device to connect to the data. You can do this using an embedded broadband modem or your cell phone or a USB broad, uh, broadband modem or through any type of tethering type device. Most of the time, the bare bones installation is you uh, four dial up connections. We install a modem. We do the configuration for the connection for a dial up modem as outlined by your carrier. And we go to connect. And again, we're going to be getting the detailed information from our carrier. This is highly unlikely for dial-up because again, dial-up is not really used anymore, but it should work. 
basic troubleshooting steps is verify the modem, verify the phone line, verify it's plugged in, verifying the details with your ISP. Moving on, how do we set up a small office home office router? We're going to be configuring that SOHO to be a multi-purpose unit, like a switch for wired connections, a wireless for uh, access point for wireless clients, and other things. Because a router has many functions. It will act as a router, so it will separate traffic between the local network and the internet. It will act as a switch for wired devices. It will act as a wireless access point for wireless devices. It will act as a DHCP server. It can also act as a firewall and NAT. It can also function as an FTP server. That's more subjective, but some can. So how do we install them? First thing is, we follow the directions by the manufacturer. In general, the directions are uh, on a computer that the router is plugged into, we install the appropriate CD, and we follow the instructions. You'll be uh, part of the uh, software package, should be setting up things like your SSID and password. That's going to be the name of your wireless and the password for your wireless. Then we're going to test connection with the browser and the internet. We could also do things like log into the router by going to its IP address. Again, it should be documented in the manufacturer settings. Uh, we should be able to log in with the admin password. Again, it's documented. And we're going to go through it. It can do basic configuration, like setting up password and setting up Wi-Fi. Uh, setting up the wireless name. Uh, viewing assignments based off of our ISP, if that's a requirement. Maybe uh, setting up static IP addresses. We have to understand a few more things like port forwarding and port filtering as well, though. So port filtering could be opening or closing certain ports based off of requirements. That's normally what a firewall does. Port forwarding allows us to have a port forward to a specific IP address that's allowed. Uh, very common when you set up like Xbox or PlayStation, you'll forward those ports to your Xbox IP address. So some general tips is when you're using port forwarding, make sure we have a static IP address from our devices. Like if you want to set a static IP to your Xbox so that you could forward the appropriate ports, that's a good idea. Different wireless standards are here, so you have to keep that in mind. You also have to know the different wireless standards like A, B, G, N, A, C, and so forth. You want to be able to talk about their speeds, their distance, things of that nature. This slide is out of date. N is no longer the latest standard. Uh, B, G, G and N are very common. B, not so much. A, C is the new standard, and it's slowly taking more and more... Uh, market shares. There are different radio frequencies that are used in our wireless. They can be both 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. So the last thing we need to talk about is how do we... No, actually, I want to talk about one more thing. Channels. Normally with channels, with wireless, we use channels 1, 6, or 11. Meaning when you're setting up your router and it talks about channels, we use either 1, 6, or 11. Those are the big three that we use always. So how do we set up wireless? First method, let's require a security key. The four general keys, sorry, the three general keys are WEP, WPA, and WPA2. Normally you're using the strongest encryption, WPA2. Other methods could be things like disabling your SID, enabling MAC filtering. They're the very not so much common anymore, but are out there. And lastly, is setting up what's called Wi-Fi Protected Setup, WPS. And that's out there, but I've not really seen it really in the business world. And that's actually it for this chapter. I want to thank you.